Welcome to Grace Community Church this morning. For those of you who may not have met me yet, my name is Teresa Breeding. I am the Women's Ministry Director here at Grace. And so, ladies, we meet once a month. We're called the Grace Sisters, and we meet on the first Tuesday of each month. So that means this Tuesday we're meeting. So we'd love for you to join us. We meet from 6 to 7.30 here at the church. And this month we are studying um, Salome, not Salome, Salome. (laughs) <laughs> and, and Herodias, and they were responsible for uh, asking for John the Baptist's head on a platter. So that should be really interesting. And we're just coming out of Halloween, so that should be great. But today, today we are studying, uh, we're continuing on in the parables of Jesus in chronological order, and we're studying the parable of the wedding feast. And I know what you're thinking, because I saw Henry right then, and he was really impressed with the decorations you know, I know y'all are thinking, wow, she really goes all out to set the scene. And you're right. No. <laughs> no. We had a wedding here yesterday, and I was like, you know what? This would just be perfect. Let's just leave it all. So it, it worked out good. I think God must have planned that. <laughs> but we're studying the parable of the wedding feast. You'll see a lot in the New Testament, Jesus referring to himself as the bridegroom and to the church. Uh, as his bride. And so we're going to look at this parable this morning. Um, in this parable, uh, just to kind of just to kind of get you in the feel of things, uh, the king would represent God, and of course the king's son would represent Jesus. So let's pray before we get started, and then we'll read out of uh, Matthew 22. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you this morning for the opportunity to be in your word together as a church. Lord, I pray that you will speak to our hearts. Lord, you planned each person that's here this morning. You planned for them to be here, and you planned for them to hear this specific message, Lord. And I pray that you'll just open our our hearts and our ears to hear what you have to say to each of us individually this morning. Speak through me, Lord, that you will be heard. We love you and we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app, you can open it to Matthew 22, uh, verses 1 through 14. And we're just going to jump in here and read this whole passage. It says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. So let's look at this a little bit more closely and see what's happening here. Because remember, this is, this is not a true story. It's a parable. Jesus told parables to teach us something. He made them up to teach us something. So it's not something that actually happened. In this case, he's teaching us what the kingdom of heaven is like, or more specifically, what the invitation to the kingdom of heaven is like, how people respond to that, and in this story, how they responded to the invitation to the wedding banquet. And so it starts out that he invited all these people to the wedding banquet. And it was kind of, the custom at that time was kind of like it is today. You know, we send out a save the date invitation to say, hey, this is coming up. And that's what they did. They would send out an invitation that would say, hey, we've got this feast, this banquet, this wedding, this party, whatever it would be coming up. And so we're going to go get everything ready and we'll let you know when it's ready. And that invitation would go out weeks, maybe even months in advance. And then when everything was ready, then they would tell the people and they would say, okay, everything's ready. Now come. 
Just like the Bible tells us that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And when it is ready, he will come back for us, right? So in this story, the banquet's ready. He says, come, but they refuse to come. So he sends more servants to tell them, the banquet's ready. I've killed the fattened calf. I've killed the oxen. Come, come. And in verse 5, it says, but they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The king has invited them to his son's wedding. This is a big deal, but they pay no attention. This would be like us getting invited to the White House and refusing to come because we had to get our oil changed or we had to get our hair cut. You know, it's, just, it's kind of crazy that people would just go off. But let's think about this. What are, what are some of the reasons that people say no to Jesus? Because notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, and one went off to the crack house, and one went off to the bar, and one went off to the brothel. It doesn't say that. It says that one went off to his field, one went off to his business. These are not bad things. These are not sinful things. Farming and business, there's nothing evil about that. But they were preoccupied with them. They were preoccupied with these things. They were the priority They were more important than the invitation to the wedding banquet. And I can relate to this. I can relate to this in my own life because before I became a Christian, before I began to follow God, I was very preoccupied with my own life. I I was raised in a Christian home. I was taught about God from a very young age, so I knew who he was. I knew that he was the creator of the world. I knew that he created me. I knew that he sent his son to die on the cross for me. I knew all of those things. But I was just busy. I was just busy doing my own thing. And I didn't didn't follow him. I was indifferent. Indifference. That's one of the responses that people have to the gospel. It was some people's response to the invitation to the wedding feast, and it's a lot of people's response to the invitation to follow Christ. Indifference. If you've ever experienced someone being indifferent to you, it's, it's not a great feeling. You know, if you've ever maybe asked somebody out on a date and been like, hey, would you, would you like to go out with me? And they say, hmm, well, where do you want to go? <laughs> well, you know, we could go out to a really nice dinner and then we could go to a movie or dancing. And they go, hmm, I don't know. I'll just, I'll pass. I'll just sit this one out. I, I got to do my hair. <laughs> you know? They're indifferent. It doesn't feel good. If you've ever been on the other end of that, it doesn't feel good. But do you know how often that we make God feel like that? We make God feel like we could just take him or leave him. It's not good. Some were indifferent. If you look at verse 6, some were hostile. The second way that people respond to the gospel is with hostility. It says in verse 6, The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. I read that and I thought, well, that's a little harsh. (laughs) You know? Somebody invites you to this really nice, fancy party, and you get mad at them, and mistreat them, and kill them? I mean, they literally hated him to the point that they would kill his servants. But we see this today, too. You know, I don't know if you've ever tried to speak with someone about the gospel or or talk to them about God, and it made them angry. You know, I have. I can remember two, two specific instances in my life where I tried to talk to people who I really cared about, about God. And in, in the first one, the person said some really, really horrible things about Jesus, things that I, I won't repeat because for fear that those words would come out of my mouth. Um, it was that bad. I don't know if they were just trying to shock me into shutting up, <laughs> but uh, it didn't go well. They, they not only rejected Jesus, they rejected me and my friendship after that. And then another person that I tried to talk to about God actually 
got angry, told me that they, they knew all about God, they just didn't want him, and literally flipped him off during the conversation, <laughs> which is a little shocking, but I think that's how they meant it, you know? And I've had people to unfriend me on Facebook because they get tired of seeing my Christian posts, you know? And it hurts, but really, that's, that's about it. You know, that's, that's about all we're going to go through here in Tennessee, you know? But in other parts of the world, it's basically illegal to be a Christian. You know, you look at like North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia. I mean, people are being, Christians are being tortured there all the time. They're being asked to renounce their faith. They have to get down on their knees with a gun to their head and they're asked to deny God. And if they don't, they'll be killed. We don't have to face anything like that here. You know, I read a, a story just this week about a guy in India who was thrown from a moving train because he had Bibles in his backpack. The gospel makes some people angry. And look at how the king responded. It says, The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. When it's time for the wedding feast, because like I said, Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And when it's ready, he will have us come. And when it's time for the wedding feast, he ain't playing around with those people that have mistreated his servants. Verse 8 says, Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. You know why they didn't deserve to come? Because they didn't accept the invitation. That's it. We see in the next part that he invited the good and the bad. So apparently, deservingness, deservedness, to You know what I'm saying. It wasn't based on on morals or ethics or nationality, but simply on recognizing the importance of the invitation and accepting it. I know I've used a similar phrase to this in my life, you know, like when a couple are in a relationship and and they break up and I say, well, he didn't deserve her anyway. You know, (laughs) you've probably said that before. Not really that he's a bad person, but just that, you know, she was great and he didn't appreciate her. He didn't make her a priority, so he didn't deserve her anyway. The people didn't deserve to come because they didn't recognize the importance of the invitation. And they should have. So then the king told them to go out and invite everybody they could find, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And they did. And the wedding hall was full of people. He said, go get anybody. Anybody and everybody. That's us, by the way. We're anybody. I mean, imagine, regardless of how you feel about him, imagine if Donald Trump's son were getting married and he invited you to the wedding. And he said, hey, come, come, stay at Trump Towers. Here's some new clothes to wear. I've got a feast prepared and I want you to come to my son's wedding. First of all, like, what are seriously the chances that you're going to get that invitation? (laughs) Zero, right? (laughs) Zero. We're not getting that invitation. But I want you to understand the outrageousness of this story. These nobodies were invited to the wedding banquet of the king. And they came with an eagerness. So that's another way that people respond to the gospel. Is with eagerness. These people were going about their daily lives too. They had other things to do too, but they dropped everything. And went to the banquet. He said everyone is invited. Jews, Gentiles. It's an open invitation. The only ones that are excluded are the ones who exclude themselves. All they have to do is accept the invitation. And we're about to see, clothe themselves in the proper attire. During this time, it would have been customary for the 
the, the king to provide the garments for the guests to wear to the wedding. And he expects them to wear them. You know, they probably, it was probably robes, and they probably had them laid out by sizes, and the people just came in and put the robe on and went on in to the feast. But it served a couple of different purposes. First, it eliminated the excuse of not having anything to wear. It's not like they had a mall to run to and get something. <laughs> and this was kind of last minute. So that eliminated that excuse, but it also it was clean. And it also eliminated social status. Uh, rich and poor could not be distinguished by their clothing. So I want to look at this because the Bible talks a lot about clothing. And it doesn't have anything to do with what you should or should not wear to church. The first time we hear about clothing in the Bible is in the very first book, the book of Genesis. If you remember, you know, Adam and Eve sinned. And then they realized that they were naked. And so they tried to cover themselves with leaves. And God killed an animal. It was the first sacrifice. God killed an animal and made clothing for them. An innocent animal's blood was shed to cover the sin and shame of Adam and Eve. God clothed them. And later on in the New Testament, we see Jesus, an innocent life, shed to cover the sin and shame of the world. So that we may be covered in his righteousness, clothed in his righteousness, in his right standing with God. Isaiah 61.10 says, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has blessed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding or a bride with her jewels. When we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, when we accept his invitation, we take on his righteousness. We are clothed in his righteousness so that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But look at verse 11. It says, But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. He had no excuse. Nothing to say, no defense. He was present, and that was good. But he wasn't clothed, and that was necessary. So when it's time for the banquet, you don't get to come in on your terms. You come on his terms. And this is where a lot of people get confused. You know, we look at a person's life, and we think, oh, he was a doctor. He helped people. He saved so many people's lives, and he helped people. Surely he's going to heaven. Or we say, oh, she was such a, a wonderful person. You know, she helped the homeless and she helped the disabled and she was so kind. Surely she's going to heaven. But that's not the criteria. Good people don't go to heaven. Saved people do. It's not about what you do. It's about who you put your faith in. Jesus. That's the only way. That's the only way. Before I came to work here at the church, about 17 or 18 years ago, the, the man that I worked for before I came here wasn't a Christian. He was a good man. He, you know, he was my friend. I loved him dearly. He was a good man, but he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a believer. But his wife was. And so he went to church with her every Sunday. He attended church every Sunday. But he, he didn't follow God. He wasn't a believer. And I'll never forget, I was a new Christian and someone had gotten me one of those little calendars where you flip it and it has a different verse each day. And I had that sitting on my desk. And I went to lunch one day and I came back and my calendar was in my trash can. And he came in and he told me that things like that did not belong in the workplace. 
and it hurt. I was a new Christian. This is a man that I really admired, really looked up to. He was good to me. He was my friend. He was the owner, and he was my boss, but he was my friend, and, and it hurt. And he went to church every Sunday, every Sunday at a good church here in Crossville, a good church. But he never put on the garments of righteousness. And I believe that if Jesus had physically walked through that church, he might have stopped at my friend and said, hey, where's your robe? Because he never put on the garments. I say never. I don't know that for sure because in what I now believe to be God's mercy, he was diagnosed with brain cancer. And he was given a very, very short time to live, which made him start to question what happens when you die. And he would sit in my office for hours and hours and ask me questions about God. And like I said, I was a new Christian. I didn't know the answers. (laughs) I couldn't share very much biblical knowledge with him at all. But I could share my faith. And I could share my love for Jesus. And what he had done for me. And I did that. Day after day after day. But he never accepted Jesus. As his savior. In those, in those times. When I talked to him. Now I am told that. In the last hours of his life. That a pastor was at his bedside. And was holding his hand. And asked him if he wanted to accept Jesus as his savior. And that he squeezed his hand. And so it's my hope. That like Sam talked about a few weeks ago, that in that 11th hour, that he accepted Jesus as his Savior. And that the Lord welcomed him that day. That he put on those robes of righteousness. And that he'll be in my welcoming committee someday when I get there. God does the inviting. And we do the accepting. He requires all who come to honor his Son. And all who do are guaranteed a place at the table. A feast beyond compare, more than we could ever think, dream, or imagine. But you know what? Some won't accept. Some won't accept. They won't put on those garments. And like this man, they will be thrown out. They will be thrown out. You know, I run into people all the time at Walmart or, you know, just wherever I'm at, I run into people all the time that haven't been to church in a while. And it's like the first thing they think of when they see me is that they haven't been to church. (laughs) And they start telling me, oh, I'm so busy. And they're telling me about how busy they are. And I get it because I'm busy too, you know. All of you are busy. You know, everybody's sitting here this morning, you're busy. Raise your hand if you're not busy, if your life's not busy. Because if you raise your hand, I'm going to write your name down (laughs) and I'm going to call you and give you some stuff to do. (laughs) But we're all busy, right? But you make time for what's important to you. Many are called. The door is wide open. Many are called. Many have been invited. But they let other things crowd out the invitation. They're so busy with other things that when Jesus comes along with the opportunity of a lifetime, they hesitate. They don't accept the invitation. And at some point, the door will close. They hesitate. This is another way that people respond to Christ with hesitation. Have you ever gotten an invitation to something? You know, maybe a wedding or a baby shower or graduation party. Got an invitation to something and they ask you to RSVP and you don't? Let's be honest, we don't because, you know, something, something better might come up. <laughs> you know, we might get another offer. Right? I've done it, I know, let's be honest. But this happens to the call to Jesus too. A person feels that tug on their heart. They feel that call. And then they go, oh wait, wait a minute. My friends are having that party next weekend. I was really wanting to have a good time. I'll just come to Jesus later. You know, they hesitate and they put it off. They delay. Some hesitate because they're too busy. Some hesitate because they don't want to give up their sin yet. 
some hesitate because they think they've got to have it all together before they can come to God. You know, when you're dirty, when you've been, you know, working outside or exercising or camping or whatever it is, and you're dirty, you need to take a bath, right? But you don't say, oh, I'm too dirty to get in that tub. I'm too dirty to take a bath. I'll just stay dirty. We don't, we don't do that, right? No, we take a shower. Get clean. Right? Satan wants you to believe that you have to be good to deserve God's grace. But that's like saying you have to be clean to take a bath. It makes no sense. The dirtier, the filthier your life is, the more you need Jesus. And the better that bath feels. He's saying, come. You know, nobody, nobody has to have the wrath of God poured out on them. Like this guy who was drug out into darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. No one has to have the wrath of God poured out on them. And know that this guy, it's not, he's, he's not being, the wrath of God is not being poured out on him because he screwed up or he made a bad decision or he, you know, felt a temptation. A person receives the wrath of God because they choose to receive the wrath of God. Because they choose it. Because when you don't choose God, you choose the alternative Instead, you have to reject his invitation. You have to say no to God. (laughs) Because understand something, if you refuse the invitation, if you refuse the offer from God, when you do that, you choose wrath. You choose it because that's all that's left. There's no other option. There's no third choice. And God doesn't want to pour out his wrath on anybody. He's saying the the invitation is for everybody. He's saying, come. He poured out his life so that we can live. You have to say no, that you don't want that. And if that's your decision, if that's your choice, God's going to respect that. Because you have free will, and he's not going to take that away from you. He could. I mean, he could make us all love him and not have a choice. But think about the people in your life that love you. What if they only loved you because they didn't have a choice? They had to love you. What kind of love would that be? Wouldn't be worth all that much, would it? Or have you ever had someone that you later found out they only loved you because they thought that you had money or power or influence? That's a worthless kind of love. God wants us to choose him. He wants us to to love him with a real love. When we say, God, I don't want you in this life, the eternal implication of that is that you don't get God in the next life, in the afterlife, for eternity. If you choose to be separated from God here, you will be separated from God there. And some may look at that and be like, oh, God's so mean that he would do that. He's so mean. Look at this passage, though. Look at the beginning of this passage. He is so gracious. He gives everyone the invitation. When you say, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, that's you saying, I'm coming to the banquet. When you get baptized, that's you saying, I'm coming to the banquet. I'm going to be a person that follows God with my life. So listen, here's the thing. Even though I see most of you here every Sunday, I'm not going to make any assumptions about where you stand with Christ. Because you could be like my friend and just be showing up out of obligation and not out of love for the Savior. So if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, 
This is your invitation. This is your invitation to accept him as your Lord and King. God's calling you to come to the banquet. And it's your choice how you respond. Will you respond with indifference or hostility or eagerness or hesitation? Or maybe you acknowledged Jesus Christ as your Savior a long time ago. But you find that you've grown distant. That your life has kind of drifted from him. So I would ask you this morning, how are you serving him with your life? Are you serving him with indifference? Just kind of going through the motions day to day. You know, thinking about him on Sunday, not really basing your life decisions on him. Or with hostility, you've gotten caught up in the world and you're, you're defensive about it. Defensive about the way that you've been living your life and the choices that you've been making. Your favorite sin has become your new God. And you're defensive. Maybe you're critical of other people who are trying to live their lives for Christ. Or are you living for Him with eagerness? You're all in. Excited to get up every day and live for Him. Doing your very best. Or are you serving Him with hesitation? You know, just kind of Serving him in the background. Hoping nobody really notices that you're a Christian. Trying not to stand out. Today's the day. Today is the day to respond to the invitation. To say yes to God. And to unite your life with him. To let your light shine for him. Today's the day to serve him with eagerness. That's the right answer. That's the only answer. All in. Today's the day. And yeah, when you go all in, you're going to mess up. But like Pastor Dennis always tells us, if we're not doing anything, we're not going to mess up. But when you're out there trying, you're going to mess up. And that's okay. We learn from that. We grow in that. Today's the day. Accept his invitation. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your word this morning. Lord, the idea, the knowledge that you, the God of all eternity, wants to spend eternity with us. Lord, that's humbling. Lord, we come to you this morning with eagerness. We want to be all in. Lord, strengthen us. Empower us to live for you every day. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that hasn't accepted you as their personal Savior, Lord, I pray that you will tug on their heart this morning, that they will accept that invitation, that they will go all in with you. And for those who have just been going at it halfway, lukewarm. Lord, I pray that you will just light a fire in us that no one can put out. We love you, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.